The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Good morning and welcome to our first time guests. I'm grateful that you have chosen to come here and worship with us uh, at Southside Bible Church. I pray it'll be a blessing uh, to you this morning. We've been in between books. I finished up preaching through 2 Peter and next Sunday, we're going to start Habakkuk, and so excited uh, to join together. I think that book is a, a perfect message for the time uh, that we live in. And so what I've been doing is I've been freelancing since I completed Second Peter, and I've just sought to shepherd the flock of God into the fullness of the unity of the Spirit and all the fruits that come from that. And I have been so encouraged with uh, the fruit in this body uh, that I've observed the last month. This morning, I wanted to leave you with a sweet gift before I go on sabbatical. Really, my, my lifeline verse as I've journeyed in the faith. 30 years of studying and, and learning this life-changing promise and chewing on it and looking at it in context and through the lens of, of life lived and, and the life of shepherding a flock of God for 30 years and learning the beauty of this promised by the the providences that many of you have had to journey. It's just one of those verses that as life fills it up, it just gets more and more precious and fuller and fuller and sweeter and sweeter and deeper and deeper. And so it's truly what my heart wants to give to this precious flock that I love with all of my heart as I step away to heal up my soul and body and emotions from another 10 years of battling uh, for souls. And so go change the oil. Good for 10 more years, Lord willing. So I even thought, uh, just what would I like to leave you with if this was my last sermon to ever get a preach to this sweet body? And so where I would like to leave you this morning is Romans 8, 28. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. And so I just want to give you a little context and then pray for God to do more than we could hope or think in this verse this morning. This promise is in the midst of Paul showing this glorious gospel that he's not ashamed of. It's laid out for us in the first five chapters. And then Paul's telling you this gospel, it will change and it will transform your life. And then it's going to give you this amazing inheritance at the end that will be eternal. And Paul is showing that that being under grace and not under law will break the dominion of sin in your life. And a key piece to that in this chapter is the absolute certainty of our security and our acceptance with God, that he is for us, absolutely for us by this gospel. Romans 5, 1 through 2, I was teaching in a community group the last couple of weeks. Therefore, having been justified by faith, this whole gospel that Paul has laid out, in light of being made right with God by the work of Jesus Christ, We now have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The enmity that was laid out in chapters 1 through 3 has been removed at the cross. The righteousness that God requires, he gives to us in Christ. Now you got peace with God. You're no longer his enemies. And through whom we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace then in which we stand. And so we no longer stand as an enemy of God by his work. We now stand in this full grace of God. His acceptance, his, his power is now toward you as children of God. And that's the power that we're looking at in Romans chapter 8. And so we, we have to get this. In chapter 8, it's, it's bookended by two, two beautiful verses. In Romans 8, 1, Therefore, in light of this gospel, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Right now, as you sit here as a child of God, there is no condemnation upon you. It's poured out on Christ. Not even a drop sits on you this morning. And then he lays out this whole chapter and he finishes in verse 38. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth And he finally just throws it out there, nor any other created thing, which is everything other than God, will be able to separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so that's got to be grasped. That's got to become that epinosis that we've been learning about 
is that I am, there's no more condemnation. I'm joined to God and there's nothing that can separate me from his love. I'm held by his power. And this is what the gospel does. It must be believed. It must be believed. And that word believed carries with it the idea of entrusting yourself to it. And so you've got to sit here this morning with that full understanding of the gospel that there's no more condemnation. I'm held by God and nothing can separate me from his love. It must be lived upon with absolute certainty for every child of God. And that will bring about the promise of Romans 8, 28. And this verse will never bear the fruit that it's intended in your life without this. Because this verse is this beautiful pillow from God for us to rest upon as we journey to glory. And if it's not understood from the eyes of your heart, the first hard thing that comes at you, your pillow is going to fall on the floor. Ever happened to you? <laughs> you just put your head down, no pillow. It's going to be gone if you don't hold to this. A pillow does you no good on a floor. You have doubt and frustration and hurt and unbelief and confusion and you'll, you'll lose this glorious promise that God has given to the people of God. And so this verse is supposed to be like, um, have you ever heard of these things? They're weighted blankets and they're supposed to put them on you and they make you feel safe and secure. You sleep better, you lose anxiety. They're, they're just incredible. They, they feel like you're being hugged, you know, because they're heavier. And so you put these weighted blankets on you. That's what this verse is supposed to be. And, and let's say your wife keeps rolling over all night and taking the blanket with her, and you, you wake up in the middle of the night with no blanket. So I'm just saying, say that happens in your house. <clears throat> and some of your lives are just like that with this verse. You just feel so secure in Romans 8, 28, and the slightest thing comes, and it pulls the pillow off or it pulls the blanket off and all of a sudden you're just in anxiety and fear and falling apart. And so my prayer is that God would put an end to that this morning in every believer's heart. I want this to be so yours that you lay on this pillow the rest of your lives until you see Jesus, no matter what comes against your life. And that the glory of this verse would be like the rising of the sun. And as you live, it will just keep getting brighter and brighter and brighter. Some of the older saints in this church, this verse is so bright, they're untouchable. And so that is a very lofty goal. And one that should start then at the throne of grace. The throne that has given you this pillow. And the throne that has sent its spirit into your heart. So you could put your head on this promise. And the throne that sent its son into the world so that you could have a Romans 8, 28. And so I want to go before God and pray this for every one of your hearts this morning. Father, I come boldly to this throne because of Christ. And God, I love Romans 8, 28. And many times we just sit at it with a shallow understanding. We just leave it in a little small seedling form. And I pray this morning by your grace through this truth of this word. God, I pray that you would make it an oak tree in every mind and heart in this room. God, I pray if there are any unbelievers, that this morning, Lord, this truth would become true of them. And I pray for every believer who's walked in here with more weights and burdens than I could ever fathom. And yet, God, you can work individual in each heart. And I just want that pillow for every one of these children of God. I pray that in the next 45 minutes, and maybe an hour and a half since it's my last sermon, God, I pray that you might give that to every believer in this room. And so do what no human being then can do and let this be the rest of every heart in Southside Bible Church, I pray in the name of Jesus, amen. I just wanna read a quick quote by John Piper. He said, if you live inside this massive promise of Romans 8, 28, your life is more solid and stable than Mount Everest. Nothing can blow you over when you're inside the walls of 828. Outside of 828, all is confusion and anxiety and fear and uncertainty. Outside of this promise of all-encompassing future grace, there are straw houses of drugs and alcohol and numbing TV and dozens of futile diversions. There are slat walls and tin roofs of fragile investment strategies 
and fleeting insurance coverage and trivial retirement plans. There are cardboard fortifications of deadbolt locks and alarm systems and anti-ballistic missiles. Outside are a thousand substitutes for Romans 8.28. But once you walk through the door of love into the massive, unshakable structure of Romans 8.28, everything changes. They come into your life, stability and depth and freedom. You simply can't be blown over anymore. The confidence that a sovereign God governs for your good, all the pain and all the pleasure that you will ever experience is an uncomparable refuge and security and hope and power in your life. Let's look at Romans 8.28. Your outline for this morning. Paul's going to give us four elements to strengthen then our confidence and our eternal security with God. We're going to look at the certainty of it, the extent of it, the recipients of it, and then the source of it. So let's take a look at verse 28. <coughs> We're gonna, the first word is and. And this conjunction links the whole chapter and all of its flow. Paul's going to show us that we have some enemies that are going to come against us. We have enemies uh, that, that come and, and attack us. We're not taken into heaven the second you believe. Okay? We will, we're not going to ride to glory on calm seas. There are some hard waters that we must navigate on our way to glory, amen? Every one of you know that this morning. And so this and, it just blasts away at this thought today that life is going to be easier because I'm a believer. Because I'm a child of God, I just feel like God's going to protect me and things are going to go easier for me. And that's just a big old lie. It doesn't say that anywhere in the Bible. This is not a verse that promises you in every cloud there is really just a silver lining, and if you look at it just right, you're going you're gonna to find it. That's a big lie. Because some of you are facing such hard things this morning, you've looked and you've looked, and there is no silver lining. No matter what angle you come at it from, there's not a silver lining. This promise is bigger and better and more glorious than a silver lining, and I want to give that to you this morning. The and tells us that no matter how bad the stuff is within us, in Romans 8, as he begins the chapter, he says, we, we got flesh. We got remaining flesh as believers. We have sin and we have lust, and they're waging war against us. And so you're going to have battles with sin that are going to be like crazy on your way to glory. And then you're going to have bad stuff from outside of you. Paul's going to say like sword and peril and persecution. People coming after you and even wanting to put you to death. All day long we've been led to slaughter. And then Romans 8, 18-25, he says that creation was subjected to futility. And so now we live in a world that without looking at God and his plan and his gospel, it's futile. And everything you chase and look to find hope in, it's, it just, it's elusive, it gets away. And so now we got a battle with depression for anyone who legitimately looks at this world without God. It is depressing, and it's falling apart, and it's breaking, and, and our governments and everybody can't find an answer, and that's all because this world was subjected to futility. And so we're in this, this battle that everything from inside and outside in the world are coming against us. And the and tells us that none of these things can bring us back under condemnation. So all of these enemies, everyone who's against you, can never bring you back into this place where you're under the condemnation of God. Even your lusts and your sins can't bring you back under the condemnation of God. You have to get that in your journey. And in the midst of all these things, that God's love and purpose for your life is right on track, and it hasn't been thwarted. I, I'm a broken record telling you this. There is no plan B in God's will for your life. Every one of you sit here this morning in plan A because it's been decreed by God, and we're going to look at what plan A is and put it in its context. And it cannot separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen? <laughs> Come on. Deadbeats. <laughs> There's going to be times in this context that Paul says, you're not going to even know how to pray. It's going to get so hard, I, I don't even know what to pray for. And he says, the Spirit 
is going to intercede for you, and he's going to pray the will of God. And so I, I'm just confused and I'm stuck, but I've got this one who dwells in me and he's praying the will of God, which in verse 28 is that God will work for your good. So the Spirit of God is praying the effectual prayers of you being conformed to the image of Christ. And so I don't even know what to pray, but the Holy Spirit sure does. And he's going to intercede for you, which is what Paul is about to unfold. And it will always be effectual, the prayers of the Spirit. And so our prayers are not even <clears throat> the foundation of this verse happening, but the Spirit and the Son from heaven interceding on your behalf. And so we have heaven and we have our own hearts with the Spirit and the Son of God all making sure that the promise we're going to look at this morning will come to pass. You love that? God has surrounded this verse with every encouragement possible. Why? because we are so prone not to believe it. We're just prone to not believe what this verse says. And so I just want you this morning to love the word and, because it just connects this whole thing and puts it in its context, and that God is working for you for your good. So let's take a look at our outline. The certainty of our confidence. And we know Paul is saying we have an absolute confidence in Romans 8.28. He doesn't even say that we deduce it or we are persuaded. But this is the end of deducing. This is the end of working through truth and doctrine and what he's been laying out for eight chapters. And we look at it all and we look at this gospel and what God has done. And we need to be able to say, we know. We know that God is working everything for my good. He doesn't say we feel. There'll be some days you will not feel like God's working for your good. You're going to feel the opposite. You're going to feel like I'm being destroyed by God. And we'll feel like God just wants to beat us down and everything that we want or desire, he just keeps withholding it. He'll never really give us what we really want. And deep down, it just feels like God wants me to be miserable. And he just wants me to limp into heaven, some miserable guy. Show of hands, <laughs> Ever, you don't have to show your hands. <laughs> Ever felt that way as a pastor? I hear it all the time, and I feel it, and I feel it. One of my favorite sermons I ever preached was when Jacob thought Joseph was dead, and now they're coming back saying that this Pharaoh wants your other son, Benjamin, to come. And Jacob cries out, and he says, all these things are against me. You ever felt that way? That's it. All these things are against me. My two sons that I love so dearly are both going to be dead. That's the battle cry of unbelief. All these things are against me. He didn't feel that things were working for his good, and yet what did God do? He kept a whole remnant alive, and he preserved the nation of Israel to bring about the Messiah by what he was doing through Joseph. And so all these things are against me why God is working out the most amazing, beautiful plan for his redemptive plan of history. And so there's going to be times where you're going to say all these things are against me. And this verse is saying there's a God who's working every one of those things for your good. So there'll be times that we might not see or perceive how God is bringing about the good. I want you to catch that. Times you will not see it. And for some, it may not be until glory when you stand on the Mount Everest and with God's eyes and you look back over your life and you'll say it was perfectly planned and decreed by God. And at this time, you have to rest on the bare promises and just the character of God and what he's telling us in this verse. That's simple. What that text just simply says, we know. We know. And I just, don't you love who's writing that? If I was writing it, you'd be like, big deal. Paul is writing it. He's been persecuted, shipwrecked, stoned, beaten, slandered, thrown into prison, starts a church, and uh, false teachers come in everywhere he goes, uh, lack of food, all the things, the daily burdens of the church. And that one writes in this pen, he says, and we know everything. Uh, my body's been beaten to a pulp. We know that God's working everything for good. And so I pray that you would resolve this in your heart because our enemy will put this to the test. 
He's going to say, God doesn't care that I'm lonely and single. God doesn't care that I'm sick. It's only the big things that God works together for good. He doesn't really care about my little details. And all hell is going to be thrown against this truth because it is the bedrock of how Romans 12 through 16 will flow out from the church where the light and the truth and the godliness is going to come. And if he can destroy this foundation, he'll destroy the church's testimony. This verse is a foundation stone to our testimony to the world that we trust God in every high and stormy gale. We're the people of God and we need to be the people who trust God. And we're going to show that forth in everything that comes into our lives. And that's when they're going to say, what's the hope within you? And so this is a foundation stone that we have to have, not just up here, but it's got to get into our hearts and into our lives. So that's the certainty. Second point is I want you to see then the extent of our confidence. (laughs) The extent is that God causes all things to work together for good. And so I, I really like that word, God the sovereign one, the unrivaled one, the one that all things just bow to his voice. There's not an atom or molecule that isn't in submission to this one. And so I just, when you hear that, that should just lift your hearts that it's God who causes all things to work together for good. And this word for all things, it's dealing with the will of God and it's our lives. And so it's this Greek word, panta, and he's saying that there's nothing outside of this word panta, that, which means all things. And so nothing can sneak into your life outside the boundaries of this verse. There's nothing you can come up with that's outside of this word panta. And so God's going to cause all things, everything in your life from beginning to end. It's limitless. It's everything. There's no restrictions or conditions on this word except that you're called and you love God. Other than that, there's nothing outside of this verse. Stick everything in it. And as you sit here, maybe in so much pain, within or without, there's nothing that you are facing that is not in this word, all things. There's nothing that you have here this morning that is not all things. So I want you to come put it where it belongs. And I want you to see everything that you are facing and carrying and dealing with uh, is in this verse, is in this promise. And he says, all these things will work together. And the first thing that hit me about this verb, it's a present, active, indicative. And it's not a future tense. And so what it's telling you is right now, even if you don't see it, God is working all things for your good. Right here as you sit here this morning, don't sit and think in in five months he might work for my good in this problem. He is right now working for your good with whatever you're facing, whatever the issue is. It's a present tense every day of your life. God is working for your good. It's a beautiful Greek word, synergeo. We get the English word synergism from it. And I look up the word synergism for those who like this kind of stuff. And it said, it's a joint action of discrete agencies in which the total effect is greater than the sum of their effects when they're acting independently. Not beautiful? <laughs> Some of you go, no, I don't get that. And others are like, that's amazing. That's why we like right brains. They, they love this stuff. And, and so the example that I always use, and I'm going to use it again, is table salt. Table salt is composed of two poisons, sodium and chlorine. How many of you like chugging chlorine? Bring, thanks, Timmy. Tim, bring them together, and, and they make French fries and steak taste amazing. And that's this promise, is it's, it's taking some things that are bad, and it's, God's going to use them, and he's going to work for your good. And this is what God does. He takes events from inside that you're battling and from outside, and he works them together for our good. And, and as we'll journey in this, it's not even that he just works them, he decrees them. <laughs> it's not like, oh, these things came into your life and I didn't see it. I brought it. I'm taking these bad things, I'm bringing them into your life, and I'm synergetoing that to work together for good. 
And so the one key I want you to catch this morning is not all the events in our lives are necessarily good. Don't, don't buy that lie. Only their effect under the hand of God and Him causing them to work for good. And we'll define what that is in a second. But I just want to make sure you catch that because sometimes Christians think i got to just say everything's good. And it isn't. It's bad and it hurts and it's hard and it's because of the fall and sin. And so these things come in and you don't have to just say they're good, but you do say God is going to use this thorn for good. Amen? You're a living testimony of that, brother. And so I got a stupid illustration that when I learn a good illustration, I use them till I die. I'm sorry. And I've never even baked cookies. But my wife has a lot, and we love it when she does. But here's, here's my just simple illustration. Baking cookies. Have you ever taken the, the butter and just took a bite out of it? And go like, that's good. <laughs> vanilla extract. and oh, I love vanilla extract. And, and just flour. You ever eaten flour? And you just look at all these horrible ingredients, and you bring them together, synergeo, and you get chocolate chip cookies dripping with milk. God will work everything for good. And I've been a pastor here for 21 years. And I know some of you who could say, I was molested by my father growing up. How's that good? My dad died when I was 10. Some of you have had a spouse walk away and all the effects on your life and your children. Some of you are unequally yoked and you just live under such horrible conditions. Some of you have had children take their lives. And you're aging and there's just one health problem after another. And your dreams have been smashed and the list just goes on and on. And that, that's why I want you to hear, those aren't good. They're not good. But our sovereign God works every one of these things for our good. He, he, he's decreed them. He's bringing them into your life to work for your good. Remember my brother Mike sat here and shared his testimony that I was bitter and, and not content. And so God took away everything. And I found the deepest, sweetest contentment I've ever found in Christ. <laughs> Sinner ghetto. Those weren't good things, losing your health and everything about your life. And yet God has worked them together to produce something so beautiful in that man. Think of Solomon who said, there's a season for everything under the sun. There's a, there's a time to, to cry and a time to laugh and to be born and to die. And all these things, the Hebrew word is it's appointed. And so God has appointed every detail of your life to work together for your good. Every season. The hand of providence brings and works and does exactly what he designs. The vastness of this promise is amazing of how many people in this world and just how many people sit in this church this morning and there's a sovereign God who's working everything in your life for your good. And so then we need to define for good. This has been butchered throughout the centuries. There's, there's a poor hermeneutic can lead you anywhere with the word good. And it's all looked at as circumstances. Circumstances. Again, a silver lining. That, that he's working for your good as there really is this good thing in this cloud. And in a month, a year, or a decade, we will see what that really was. And so just hold on and be patient, and you're going to find out that there was a silver lining. But this promise is to the totality of your life that every detail of it, God is working for your good. What is that good? And you have to get this or your pillow will keep falling on the ground through your whole life. And so look at good in verse 28. Verse 28 says that it's good for those who have been called according to his purpose. God has a purpose for your life. He's called you to it. In verse 29, he says for. So the for is connecting what is good. And it's for those whom God foreknew he also predestined. He's comforting you with predestination. He predestined you to become conformed to the image of His Son, that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. He's predestined that you would be conformed to the image of Christ. 
And so he's going to work everything in your life for good, and the good is you being conformed to Jesus Christ. That's the good that's being promised. There's a God who's going to bring whatever it takes to conform you into the image of his Son. And verse 30 gives it more legs. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he justified because they had faith and believed in Christ. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. And every one of those are aorist verbs in the past tense. So in the past tense, he called you. In the past tense, he justified you. In the past tense, he glorified you. How does God say you're glorified as you sit here on this earth this morning? Because it's done. And the decree of God, it's as if it's already done. Nothing can stop it. Nothing can thwart it. You're going to, give, you're going to be glorified because God has said so. He can talk about it as if it's already done. <laughs> he will work for your good. He will conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. He will not fail at this program and plan that he's called you to. Praise God. He's working all things for your good to conform you to Christ and the ultimate conformity to Christ when we breathe our last. What a promise that God has given to the children of God. And so get this, God is working everything to conform you to the image of Christ, working everything to bring us to glory. And nothing can thwart that. Nothing created will ever be able to stop what God has begun. So whatever you're sitting here with this morning, it is from God's good hand. And he's using it to shape and to mold you into the image of Jesus Christ. It's an amazing promise. His promise is not to make Denver paradise, but to bring you safely to paradise. And so we, on verse 18, we consider then that our sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed to us. And so to rise up and say this isn't fair is to rise up against infinite love, infinite goodness and wisdom who's fashioning our lives in such a way to bring about our good reflection of Jesus Christ. Everything. Everything. God is working for this end. And I've, I, I like this other illustration. There was this guy working on a chunk of marble and he's just kind of sitting there chiseling away at the marble and a guy walked by and said, what are you doing? And he said, well, everything that doesn't look like a horse, I'm chiseling away. And in the same way, God says, everything that doesn't look like Jesus Christ, I'm gonna chisel away. And it's not gonna be by sunny days sitting by the ocean and smiling. That isn't how you're going to get chunks taken off of you. It's going to be a furnace, and it's going to be hard, and it's going to be afflictions, and it's going to be doubts, depressions, and wanderings. And he's going to use everything necessary to make Jesus Christ, to conform you to that image. That's what your God is committed and devoted to do. Do you despise that? And the call this morning is to embrace such goodness and lay your head down on this beautiful promise from God and right now, by faith, I just want everyone in this room to rest on this. And I just want you to realize, I, was, well, I went back to when I preached on this probably 15 years ago, maybe. And when I preached this in my notes, we were supporting a missionary, <clears throat> one of the godliest men I've known in my journey, and still to this day, and he was going out to Mozambique from a sister church in California. And he had all these beautiful young kids and and he went out and he came back broken from how hard it was and the enemy's attacks and the fruit of the whole trip out there all of his kids went apostate from how mad they were about growing up in Africa and all the things that they went for, went through and when I saw him at the fire conference I just saw this broken man who was even more like Jesus Christ than when he sold everything and went to follow Christ to Mozambique. And the reason I bring that up is it doesn't just always work out like roses. I'm going to go to ministry. I'm going to go do this. And God's plan might be something completely different of what he's going to do in your life. I had coffee with a brother last week who went out to plant a church in Mexico and had to come back and He's so broken and hurt and the fruit that's starting to come out 
of his life would have never come out if everything just exploded and went perfect. And so I just want you to, just to get real with you, is it can get really hard and be the opposite of anything you planned, hoped, or dreamed. I'm just tired of this lie that you're just going to, just everything's going to go great now because I'm a Christian. He's going to work everything for good, and it's this Pollyanna theology. And I just want you to see that it, it can be really hard, and you might bury children, and you might get cancer, and you might go to seminary and end up destroyed and broken, and God will use it for your good. And so I just, I want us to deal with this promise and truth this morning. It doesn't always end up, and they lived happily ever after, serving Christ. Many Christians dazed all over this country because of the confusion of this verse. This is a promise that life will get hard and even harder as a believer, because all hell is against you now. And God will take everything, and I mean everything from shocking to shattering things, to work it for your good, to conform you to the image of Christ, and to prepare you for glory. That's the end of the promise. But God is going to conform you to Christ, and he's going to use Ponta. He's going to use all things, and he's going to sinner ghetto them in your life so that you will start looking like Jesus Christ. And there's no other way to get to conformity to Christ than through these things that God will handpick perfectly for each one of your lives. By faith, will you crawl under this great promise of God and say, we know, we know what this promise is and what it's not. And we're going to live in it the rest of our days here on this earth. I bow to this until it climaxes in your eternal good and you'll be seen in Christ, realized and enjoyed, and it'll never be threatened again. I just love this little preposition. He works all things ace for good, and it, it means to come from the outside and to be brought into the middle of something. And so God is going to take all these bad, hard things, and he's going to bring them into this little circle called good. And he's going to work them for good, and that good is just conformity to Christ. And when this happens, you're going to get things like John Calvin in July 1542. A son was born, and two weeks later he died. <clears throat> and Calvin said, The Lord has certainly inflicted a severe and bitter wound in the death of our baby son. But he is himself a father and knows best what is good for his children. And Hudson Taylor lost his little eight-year-old daughter, and he knelt down at her coffin and said, God, uh, you said, when I am weak, so be it. And he committed himself more to the service of the Chinese with the gospel. Sarah Edwards buries Jonathan and says, Oh, a good Lord has brought about this affliction. Let us embrace the rod. Spafford loses his daughters and, and he writes that hymn, It is well with my soul. The saints that I get to watch on a daily basis in this church, it just goes on and on. Uh, Aaron shared his testimony with the men yesterday, and it was just a beautiful testimony of how God worked for his good and the experiences that just looked like he was destroying him. We are a band of believers who testify to the beauty and the truth of this verse and seek to help each other hold on to it and trust it and believe it with corruptions within and fears without, where we're a community to help each other hold to this promise and, and, and journey together in it because it gets tempted and tested. So join together and help each other believe this promise. Okay, that was long-winded. So number one, certainty. And we know the extent God causes all things to work together for good, and I need to move quickly now. The third point is the recipients. The recipients, I think I'm going to skip a couple of these notes. The recipients are those who love God. And, and when Paul writes this letter, he says, I write to those who are beloved of God in Rome. And then he shares the love of God and what his son came and did. And then he says, now the Spirit will shed abroad in your hearts the love of Christ. And, and I, again, Lloyd-Jones said that's subjective. And that the Spirit of God is going to testify to your spirit that you're children of God and the love of God. And so those who love God, not just what he gives you, this is those who have been born again and I just love God. And they can hold to this promise because I love God. If I just love his gifts, you take away his gifts and I, I, I hate them. And I'm mad at him and I scream at him. 
But those who love God can bow to this verse because they love him and they know it and they can trust his hand because it's a good, loving, fatherly hand. And so I can let it have its way in my life. And so this verse is for those who love this God with their heart, mind, soul, and strength. And it's for those who are called those who were dead in trespasses and sins and God called you to life, he gave you faith and he's joined you to Christ. And so again, this is children's bread. This promise, if you're here as an unbeliever, I, would, I hate to tell you this, but everything is working for your, it says in Romans 2, you're storing up wrath for the day of wrath. Everything's working for your eternal judgment against you. And there's a Christ who will come and bear that judgment on a cross so that now God will take everything in his power called grace and he'll work for your good to change you and conform you to Jesus Christ and give you eternal life. So you, right now, everything's working against you. Come to Christ to turn that hand from displeasure and wrath to favor and kindness and love and nurture. And the, the turning point is the cross of Jesus Christ. What will you do with this sweet Savior? Believe in him. Come to him and repent and receive eternal life. And so this promise is for the called and those who love God. The beauty of this promise is I just want to grow in it and know it and trust God daily in this, what this can do for the children of God. And I'm just going to close. Man, I'm going to close with a bunch of last thoughts that could go on for an hour. I'm going to go through them just so quickly. I'm sorry. Someone told me, do not cut your sermon short. And I just... I got to love our nursery workers. <sighs> Thank you, Heidi, for what you do in our nurseries. First, I want you to repent if you've lost this focus. If you've made your life plans, your plans bigger than the purpose of God, and you're embittered at his sweet providences that he's bringing into your life, if you're putting your wisdom up against an all-wise God, I, I need you to repent don't nurture bitterness and, and call yourself a realist. <laughs> there's, there's just no other way to be now. Stop it. There's a God that you need to repent and think rightly about this God who's working everything for your good. In 1 Peter, he says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Bring yourself under his humiliations. Receive them so that he can put you on display for his glory. And so repent if you're just sitting here bitter and mad and angry at the good hand of God and what he's doing in your life. Just stop. He's good. He's working for your good. Receive this. Second, lay down on a bed of roses. This is the sweetest promise I know as a battered Christian. The freedom to know that it's, listen to this, it's not you working for your good. That can set you free this morning. Some of you, you're working for your good. And everything's dependent on you. And you're, you're fearful and you're anxious because you're trying to work for your good. And you need to come just lay down on this bed of roses and let God work everything for your good. Your prayers are just informing God how to run his universe. <laughs> Stop, okay? Let God work for your good and trust. My life has not been what I wanted. It's not even a glimmer. My fear is being nominal a life of what I hate doing, everything's bad under the sun, step into the fullness of this promise and live. And then fourthly, live radical for King Jesus. This promise is not to sit back and kick your feet up and, and, and like that great theologian, Timon, he said, akuna matata. That is a wonderful phrase. And, but that is what I see in this world. Romans 8, 28 is a kuna matata. I can just kick back and do nothing and everything's good. Everything's great. I don't, it just feels so good to do nothing and God's working for my good. But in the context, Paul says, I'm eager to preach the gospel in Rome. I'm a debtor to all men. I must tell all men of this free sovereign grace that I've received. And, and as you go out with this gospel, you're going to be persecuted by sword. You're going to have attacks from within and without. This is the people who look at a promise and as one great preacher said, now this promise of Romans 28 causes you to move toward needs and not to your comfort. So Romans 8, 28 is to engage you in the great commission. I need to be unashamed as I go after souls and people and go after all of these things. Romans 8, 28, go after the gospel, the kingdom advance and be unafraid and unashamed because he's going to work everything for your good. Some of you need to leave this country. And some of you need to walk across the street and just have a coffee with your neighbor. 
And some of you need to walk up to a new person and ask if you can pray for them after church. And some of you need to sell all and go to seminary. I just watched my little daughter pull out with her little truck and her new husband and no money going off to seminary and just looking at him going, man, I remember doing that and you have no idea what's coming. (laughs) Others, you need to have a mom's group in your neighborhood and some of you just need to quit forsaking the assembling together. And I want Romans 8.28 to set you free to live for this God. Cure for worrying. Worry is that God will get it wrong. I just want you to ponder and wrestle. This is, this is so big. Uh, I, I like what Luther would say to Melanchthon. Cease being God and just quit worrying and enter into this promise. And it's a cure for discontentment. You're, you're not here for this life. You're here for eternal life. And it doesn't have to go the way you want it or planned or purposed. But I'm telling you, it will end the way you want it, child of God. Keller says, God does not promise better life circumstances. He promises you a better life that ends in the best life. Conformity to Christ is the best life. And the final stage is the perfect life. John Newton said, everything that he sends is necessary and everything he withholds is not necessary. And so I pray that we will lay hold of this. And um, this morning, I, I've asked uh, my son to come share uh, my favorite song that he wrote. And it's all about what I just preached on. And so I just said, you come make application uh, instead of me. So I'm going to ask, uh, I'll, I'll pray, and then you guys come up and, and, and play that for us. <coughs> God, I come before you. And I love Romans 8, 28. Father, what we looked at this morning is so beautiful. And now I pray by your spirit, make application to every mind and heart. Take away these anxieties and fears and control. God, break down these idols and let them joyfully and safely put their head on the pillow of Romans 8, 28 and to surrender all the fear and anxiety that you're going to work every detail, ponta, everything in their life to shape them into the image of Christ. Let them relax and just breathe a deep sigh of relief this morning that they don't have to work for their good. God, help them to, to find this beautiful joy and peace this morning, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.